Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, January 20th. We are joined today by Yukon Premier, the Honourable Sandy Silver, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Once again, our sign language interpreter is Mary Thiessen, and our French language translation from French Language Services Directorate is André Boussier. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have two questions. Before we begin, I'd like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having a problem, please email ecoinfo at gov.yk.ca. Premier Silver. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we're here on the traditional territory of the Kwan Dun First Nation and the Taankwachin Council. Uh, today is a historic day, uh, Joe Biden being sworn in as the 46th President of the United States and Kamala Harris being sworn in as the first female and first black Vice President of the United States. Uh, with all that being said, closer to home, um, we look forward to, uh, uh, to uh, closer relationships with Alaska. Uh, I want to start today uh, by thanking all of uh, you, Connors, uh, for your dedication for uh, the Safe Six Plus One. We currently have no active cases of COVID-19 in the territory. This is extremely welcome news, and it really speaks to the vigilance of everyone in the territory. So, thank you very, very much. Our collective efforts to keep our territory uh, health, healthy and, and safe are clearly working. And it does not uh, mean that the work is over, but I want to pause and say thank you for your diligence. Um, you know, we can't let our guard down, and I will be that broken record again today. Uh, the best thing that we can do uh, now, as the vaccines are rolling out, to keep you, Connors, uh, safe is to keep on practicing the safe six plus one. Washing your hands often, maintaining physical distance, staying home if you're sick, traveling responsibly and respectfully, self-isolating as required, and also following gathering guidelines that are in place, including limiting indoor gatherings to 10 people. The plus one, of course, is making sure that you mask up in public. You're doing it, as you know, uh, again, keep on reiterating, this is to keep yourself safe, but it's also to keep your family and your friends safe, uh, your colleagues and your neighbors safe, your community safe. Uh, in the last week, we have laid one additional charge under the Civil Emergency Measures Act uh, for failure to self-isolate. And I've said this before as well, self-isolating is not a suggestion. It's not something that you can choose to ignore if it's inconvenient. Uh, Self-isolating requirements are in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our territory. When you fail to self-isolate, you put your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues, all Yukoners at risk. What we need to do now is, again, continuing to do our part to keep fellow Yukoners safe. And for those of you out there that have been diligently following the Safe Six and wearing a mask, thank you very much for your sacrifices for all of the communities. Uh, we're now in our third week of uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, we've immunized uh, more than 2,600 individuals. This has been really great to see, uh, people stepping up and getting immunized. Really cool to see people's stories on Facebook as to why they're getting vaccinated. Um, we are rolling out the vaccination in a way that prioritizes uh, Yukoners that are most at risk. We started with residents and staff at our long-term care homes. I'm very proud to say that 91% of our long-term care residents have received their first doses of the vaccine. This is a fantastic rate of uptake, and it would not uh, have been possible without the dedicated teams of peoples uh, that are working in our long-term care homes here in Whitehorse, but also in McDonald Lodge in Dawson City. There's also lots of planning uh, that, uh, that had to occur, occur uh, and things went incredibly smooth. So a big thank you to all of those uh, who continue to support our, uh, our older Yukoners. Our elders and our seniors are very, very brave and continue to lead by example uh, in our fight against COVID-19. This week, our first uh, mobile team, Balto, traveled to Watson Lake to provide the vaccine to residents of age 18 years and older. I want to thank Chief Stephen Charlie of the Liard First Nation and Mayor Chris Irvin of, the, uh, of Watson Lake for getting immunized and speaking out about the importance of doing so. This kind of leadership is really important right now and it's wonderful to see, so thank you very much. I also want to thank everyone in Watson Lake, Lower Post, 
Liard River, uh, Good Hope Lake, for helping to make sure uh, that everybody was aware that the mobile teams are coming. The Balto team immunized more than 360 people over two days in Watson Lake. There was capacity to do additional vaccines if residents uh, had opted to come. Uh, thank you to everyone who did choose to get their shot. Uh, you are helping to keep your community safe. I want to give a special shout out to the entire Balto team for running an extremely successful uh, first clinic in Watson Lake. I'm not sure if people really appreciate how much work is involved in safely and effectively rolling out this vaccine. Of course, everybody knows that the vaccine needs to be kept at certain temperatures when it's being transported and stored. But once it's thawed for use, it's absolutely go time. Uh, the vials cannot be frozen again after they're thawed for use. Uh, um, each vial contains enough vaccines for 10 doses. And uh, once they, the vials are open, they're only good for six hours. So we need to ensure that we have 10 individuals ready to be immunized for each vial that we do open. This is why we are getting Yukoners to book appointments so that we can maximize the use of each of these vials. That's extremely important, booking your appointments. In rural Yukon, clinics are open to all persons who are uh, over the age of 18, but the vaccine is quite fragile and extra precautions need to be taken during transport. We only transport as much as we need so that we, know in we need to know in advance in each of these communities how many vials we're going to need. Booking appointments also allows us to know how much vaccine to open and have ready so that we can ensure that we make best use of, the, uh, of, the pr of these precious vaccines. Booking appointments also allows us to manage the flow of people so that we can ensure physical distancing is practiced and everything is sanitized properly. Our goal is to roll out this vaccine as quickly as possible, but our priority is to do it in the safest way possible. Our clinic in Whitehorse opened yesterday, focused in on those who are high risk, including anyone over the age of 70, uh, and those living in group settings, such as uh, group homes and shelters. Uh, we ask, uh, or sorry, as well as frontline healthcare workers as well. Our second team, uh, our second mobile team, Togo, uh, will start immunizing folks in Beaver Creek tomorrow. If you're living in Old Crow or Beaver Creek, sign up for your appointment right now. Go, to, go online to yukon.ca and follow the links. Or call 1-877-374-0425 uh, for help booking a time. If you're living in Carcross, if you're living in Tagish or Teslin, uh, or even Dawson City, beautiful Dawson City. Uh, vaccine clinics are coming next week. Uh, so also book your appointments now. You do not want to miss this opportunity. You can find the full vaccine rollout schedule online at yukon.ca. And as I said, we are prioritizing uh, those at most risk. Um, in just three weeks, uh, the clinics will be open to all those uh, age 18, uh, sorry, the Whitehorse Clinic uh, will be open to uh, those that are over the age of 18, uh, everybody in Whitehorse. And uh, I encourage everyone to remain patient and wait your turn. And again, a necessary need to, to uh, figure out who's in line there with online bookings. There's no need to try to sneak in before a, a mass clinic opens. Everyone who wants to be immunized will get a chance in the upcoming weeks. When it's your turn, I strongly urge you, I'm encouraging everyone, please get immunized. The goal is to protect all Yukoners and to stop the spread of COVID-19, which means that it is most effective if everyone who is eligible gets vaccinated. We are working towards getting 75% of our, the adult population vaccinated, and we need Yukoners to step up and to take their shots. Remember, uh, we all have a role to play in keeping our territory healthy and safe. And uh, you, can assure, uh, you can be assured that the vaccines themselves are safe. Uh, we've said this before, but going through Canada's, uh, Health Canada's approval process is recognized internationally as the gold standard when it comes to medicines. And you can find accurate and detailed information about vaccines online at yukon.ca. 
The vaccine is a, absolutely an important uh, step in our fight against COVID-19. This vaccine will help save lives here in Yukon and across Canada and across the world, but we all need to do our part. I know I sound like a broken record, but get your shot when the clinic is in your community and we can move past uh, the immunization and hopefully into a brighter 2021. As you wait your turn to be immunized, stay vigilant, Yukoners. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, and it's still important to practice the safe six. In the coming days, uh, we will be uh, closing down the drive-through testing center on the Alaska Highway uh, because the additional capacity that it provided is no longer needed. We recently have seen very few people at the uh, drive-through testing center. Now, nevertheless, COVID testing and assessment center is still open now uh, and available to administer tests for everyone who needs it. You can find more details out uh, about the, uh, the clinic, uh, the center, uh, as well as online self-assessment tools at yukon.ca. Now, Dr. Hanley will speak uh, to this in more detail, but I'm very happy to share that Yukon now has the swish and spit test uh, as, an off, uh, as an option for, uh, for younger people in our territory. This is great news for Yukon families, and I really want to thank Dr. Hanley and his team for their work in making this test available here in Yukon. Testing and tracing are still essential uh, in our efforts to manage this pandemic. I believe the team at the Chief Medical Office of, of Health and, and the, uh, the clinics, uh, the YED, YCDC, uh, have done an impeccable job of tracing and testing, uh, you know, leading the country. Um, so again, please don't hesitate to get tested if you have symptoms. Uh, minimizing the spread of COVID-19 is especially important as we continue to roll out the vaccines across the Yukon. Thank you uh, to all Yukoners for your ongoing efforts. Uh, remember to be kind, uh, patient, and excellent to each other. Uh, we are all in this together, and together we will get through this. Thank you very much. Masi Cho, Ganeshish, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Mr. Premier. And I will um, <clears throat> reiterate and, and elaborate on, on some of the points that the Premier made, uh, as, as he mentioned. And as, um, as the Premier reported, no new cases in Yukon and no active cases. <clears throat> it always feels great to arrive once more at zero. But every time that we get there, we have to remember, enjoy the moment, but it's not time to relax. It may be easy to let up our guard, especially as the vaccination campaign has begun. But it's important to stay alert to the risk of further cases coming in and the risk of spreading if COVID does arrive in territory. There is remarkably little viral activity of any kind at the moment as reflected in our current low testing numbers. We have no influenza. We are hearing little about even colds and other respiratory illnesses circulating. Emergency visits for flu-like illnesses remain low. We are likely seeing the effect that our public health measures have on reducing transmission of any kind of viral infection, as well as less importations of virus into the territory. On the flip side, that means that any respiratory symptoms should be considered as potentially COVID. Ensure that you follow the traffic light guidance. Any red symptoms, cough, fever, or difficulty breathing, and any combination of two or more yellow symptoms persisting more than a day, you need to self-isolate and arrange for testing. See the traffic light posters online for more details, and look for the section that says guidelines for living and working during COVID-19. And uh, then they have the three categories. Can your child go to school? Can your child go to daycare? Can you go to work? So as we enter our third week of administering vaccines, we have vaccinated now a total of 2,590 people by the end of yesterday, a number that corresponds to about 8% of Yukon's adult population. The pace is starting to pick up. As the Premier said, Team Balto returned from Watson Lake last night, our first vaccine clinic in rural Yukon. The clinics went very well, and we've heard very positive feedback from the community. Residents of Watson Lake and Upper Liard 
were joined by residents of Lower Post in getting their immunizations against COVID-19. And we saw 634 individuals receive the vaccine. The oldest individual to get vaccinated, as far as I know, in Watson Lake was an elder of 96 years. And you'll see on Facebook pictures of elder Minnie Caesar getting her shot. Her family was hesitant because of some of the comments and doubts they have seen and read on social media and on television. But when they got some good information from supportive health staff, the family called and the worker was, the healthcare worker involved in her care was able to assist this 96 year old elder to receive her shot at the clinic. I think her only complaint was that she should have gotten the shot in her other arm as her good arm was sore. Her story has been shared by the First Nation in the Liard First Nation and demonstrates, I think, with that with good information, people can have confidence to do the right thing. Protect our elders was the theme that I saw posted on Facebook, and that is so much our focus in these first few weeks of vaccination. We had quite the team in Watson Lake. 16 members traveled by coach and by air to support this endeavor, and some of them have had their own important reasons for wanting to be part of this massive effort to vaccinate and protect Yukon residents from the virus. One individual told the team that her parents named her after an aunt who had succumbed to Spanish flu as a young child. She stated she was extremely proud to be part of the fight against COVID-19 in Yukon. Another had a close friend with COVID-19 who had been on a ventilator outside for six weeks fighting for his life. And just this past Sunday was the patient's birthday and he's starting to turn the corner. Several team members have lost family and friends in the South to COVID-19. While others said that though their parents were gone before this pandemic happened, they would not have wanted to see their lives ending this way. These stories are really touching and offer a humble reminder of how lucky we have been in Yukon so far throughout this pandemic. One team member said she could hardly contain her excitement about being part of this and being able to show a familiar face to communities to support them in getting vaccinated. I'm sure there are many more stories that the team members are sharing with each other and there'll be more stories to tell as they continue to visit communities in the coming weeks to administer COVID-19 vaccine. This shared experience amongst the team will create an unbreakable bond as they continue to visit communities across the territory. It's these stories we need to hear to remind us that this vaccine is not only helping us fight off the virus, but is helping us prevent the destruction that this pandemic has brought in other parts of the world. Tomorrow, the teams will be in Beaver Creek and then on Friday, Oak Crow. And this week, people in Teslin, Pelly Crossing, Dawson City, Car Cross, and Tagish will be able to register for their appointments. If you are eligible for the vaccine, please visit the Yukon.ca This Is Our Shot section to book your appointment. Each week, appointments will be opened for the following week. I'm certainly proud of our efforts and our initial success in administering vaccines. A great deal of thought has gone into the rollout, which is based on the guidelines set out by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI. As we progress in these initial weeks, I must also ask you to be patient for your turn. It is coming soon. As we work through the older ages and the frontline healthcare workers and take some of our care of some of our most vulnerable Yukoners, immunization for the public opens a mere three weeks from today. Far beyond any other risk category is age, which is why in these initial weeks, we are taking care of our elders. I care deeply that we get to those with chronic diseases and to all of our essential workers in so many different sectors. We are so lucky that we can address all of these important categories of people when we open the clinic to all. We're again fortunate to be seeing all within the first quarter, as long as our vaccine supplies continue to roll in. 
people need to know and to remember that we will be one of the first jurisdictions in Canada to be able to vaccinate the majority of our adult population. And our population can be immunized well before our friends, family, and neighbors to the south. So I know, and I've heard from many who can't wait to get in line for their shot. I'm one of those waiting for my turn. But I also know that some are holding back or still not sure about the vaccines or have questions. I understand and I know the pace from onset of the pandemic to arrival of vaccines has been dizzying, if not astounding. I urge you, though, to look for the answers to your questions. We have posted information on the website and you will now see a list of questions and answers. Ask questions. Ask your doctor or your healthcare provider. Call the COVID info line. Talk to your community leaders. I know that a frequent question is about adverse effects and how we are doing and how we are following them. First of all, we do track adverse events following immunization. That's a critical part of a successful immunization program. We know that these vaccines were very safe as they went through the clinical trials. Apart from minor local side effects, <clears throat> allergic reactions were the only serious side effects observed between both messenger RNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna products, at a rate of about one per 100,000 individuals vaccinated. This is generally as well what is being seen in real life since these vaccines have been deployed. All of these immediate allergic reactions that have happened have been successfully treated on the spot. Minor local side effects are common with Moderna and you need to anticipate these. A sore arm, muscle aches for a day or two, even a rash at the injection site, and sore lymph glands under the arm. These are a nuisance, but they are also a sign of how the body's immune system is reacting and getting primed to recognize, and fight off the COVID virus. Annoying as they may be, local reactions are a sign of successful vaccine uptake and a strong immune response. The second shot, as it boosts immunity, will also bring increased local side effects. In Yukon, after more than 2,000 vaccines in arms, we've had only two adverse events reported to us, and both of these have had to do with allergic-type reactions, not of the anaphylactic type, and neither with any lasting effects. We do report these up nationally, so they are fed into a national monitoring system. As of January 8th in Canada, there were 24 reports received from both Pfizer and Moderna products, only one due to Moderna, with no serious consequences attributed to either vaccine. So far then, uh, the overall number of adverse events is low and there are no safety signals, surprises or unusual events that were not expected from the trial data. These results should be updated in the next few days. You can find these results online if you search for COVID Vaccine Adverse Effects Canada. For those of us waiting anxiously for our turn, a few more comments. Since the beginning of this pandemic, of course, I've encouraged all of us to remain together in these unprecedented times, and we really largely have. We're a close-knit community, and we do need to remain as such. We mustn't forget that we've been in this together as a territory, making sacrifices for the health of our family, our community, and ourselves. The anxiety as we see cases surge down south and hear of the ongoing containment efforts in Fort Nelson and Fort Liard can bring on a sense of urgency and the need to receive the vaccine as quickly as possible. Let's remember that, as reflected in our current COVID position, we know what to do to keep COVID numbers low. We can and need to keep doing this in the weeks and months ahead of us. But we also will get there soon with the vaccine. And let, re let me remind you that we have that promise from Canada of sufficient vaccines for all who want and need vaccine. And in a few short weeks, on February 10th to be exact, all adult Yukoners over the age of 18 will be able to book an appointment for the weeks ahead of that. 
And as the Premier said, the mouth rinse and gargle test is now going to be available. A nasal a nasal pharyngeal swabbing is not a pleasant experience, especially for children. We all know that. But until this point, it was the only method of testing we've been able to offer. So now, as the Premier mentioned, we're launching the mouth rinse and gargle test for children aged 5 to 18 years old in Whitehorse uh, at the COVID testing assessment centre. And we're close to having this available in community health centres as well. If your child is feeling ill and requires testing, and again, use that traffic light guidance to know if it's um, when, when you should get tested and how, then they may be able to get a COVID-19 test by foregoing that swab way up through the nose and instead doing the swish, gargle and spit with sterile salt water or saline solution into a tube. We've worked closely with our colleagues at the BC CDC lab as they evaluated British Columbia's pilot test of the swish and gargle test. After our own pilot testing here, we can now offer this method of testing as an alternative to nasal swabs for ages 5 to 18. One of the great features of the mouth rinse and gargle uh, collection for the test is that a healthcare professional is not required at the time to collect the sample. Most children and their parents or caregivers with them can do it themselves within the comfort of their own homes. We have created step-by-step -step instructions which you can find online at the yukon.ca site. This test though is not just spitting into a tube. It's essential for parents or, or the caregivers of the children to ensure that children follow these instructions to ensure that the sample is viable for testing. To ensure that the results are accurate, we will be sending all collections to BC to confirm the results, as we do um, uh, with all our tests. As the pandemic continues, we'll continue to explore alternative options for testing. The mouth rinse and gargle test is not yet available across Canada, only a few provinces having introduced it so far. So we're very happy to offer this less invasive alternative to children, ensuring that they can be tested adequately without all that fuss of a nasal pharyngeal swab. So again, for today, some take homes. If your child is ill, we now have the mouth rinse and gargle test available and visit the website for more information. The vaccine clinics continuing to progress well and we're only a couple of weeks away from the time when any adult wanting the vaccine can start booking a time slot for immunization that begins February 10th. And as we reach zero active cases once more, keep your guard up and consider testing anytime you get symptoms that might be COVID. As the Premier says, always remember the safe six plus one, use your mask. And this is the best way we have to protect ourselves from COVID-19. That's all for my update. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Cho. Remember to take care of each other. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Silver. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. We'll now go to the reporters, and we'll begin with Haley, Yukon News. Thank you. I guess my first question isn't COVID-related. It was about uh, the comments about the inauguration day down in the States. Um, could you just elaborate on what you meant by um, closer to home, looking forward to a, maybe a closer relationship with Alaska? Yeah, I think it just gives us pause. <clears throat> you know, we have a new administration and uh, we know that we have uh, new things to consider uh, with overall uh, conversations. Uh, one thing that, that comes to mind for me is, uh, is uh, the porcupine caribou uh, herd uh, and uh, good to see uh, a federal government that hopefully will be more supportive of protections there. Thank you. Uh, my other question was about the Moderna vaccine supply. Um, we saw this week changes in the Pfizer delivery. Yeah. Um, do we have news about um, how many Moderna doses were are confirmed now from the federal government? No, we have nothing new uh, to, to uh, report at this point, uh, other than I had a conversation directly with uh, Minister uh, Dominic LeBlanc uh, about, um, you know, again, I've always said the, the quicker we get uh, shipments, uh, the better, uh, especially when you have a commitment, uh, the federal government's commitment of having 75% um, of our adult population over 18 um, uh, immunized, uh, enough vaccines in the first quarter. Uh, my push is to continue 
continue to say this is great for Canada uh, if Yukon and the other territories uh, gets to that herd immunity as quickly as possible, being smaller jurisdictions population-wise, but also the proof uh, from our medical teams to be able to effectively and safely get into our communities uh, and start uh, uh, vaccinating folks. We're building every day capacity and moving forward and you know working through those uh, you know things that, uh, that come up along the way. Uh, but we are there. We have the ability as a as a territory to immunize our entire adult population, and this would be great for Canada. This would be great for for uh, for us as well to do that as quickly as possible. So continuing to urge the federal ministers. Uh, uh, to give us um, all the details on distribution. Thank you. We'll move now to John, CKRW. Hi. Uh, my question is also vaccine-related. Um, I'm just interested, uh, Premier Silver, you mentioned how uh, once the vaccine is thought out, it it's it's go time with that vaccine. So I'm wondering if will there be any repercussions for someone who misses an appointment that is scheduled, seeing as we're trying to not really waste any doses. That, that's a really good question, and you know, on uh, what I've noticed this week uh, with our updates and talking with Dr. Hanley and the team, and Knox also with uh, uh, Minister Frost, is you know, information will come in on a case by case basis. Whether it's um, uh, not being able to get your second shot for an emergency situation that you didn't uh, know of when you booked your vaccines, those types of things. Um, We'll have less issues than other jurisdictions in Canada, I would say, because we do have an expedited uh, process here in the first three months. Uh, but those individual cases are being worked out. I've talked to Dr. Hanley of a few different cases in, in Dawson uh, that uh, you know people are asking me what happens if, those types of things. Uh, but really, uh, we're looking at it on the other side of things as well, where, uh, you know, if we get out to a particular community and we don't uh, vaccinate as many people as we thought, well, then we could use those uh, access supplies for the general clinic in Whitehorse. So, I think what I'm I know what I'm seeing from uh, the, the the team at Health uh, is they're very stingy with uh, you know with making sure that all of these vaccines are used. You know, they they take a lot of pride. It was the conversation we had last week where a half of a dose uh, was uh, was was ruined and. And, uh, and people were really upset about that. Uh, so the care and consideration that we have of the vaccines gives me a lot of uh, confidence that we, we won't see uh, a lot of wasted doses in, in the strategy that uh, the team at Health and Social Services and the Chief Medical Officer of Health team and uh, Communicable Disease Center have uh, designed for, uh, for UConn. Do you have a follow-up, John? Yes. Uh, now, it was mentioned that we're hoping to achieve herd immunity uh, as soon as possible. I guess, what are some of the limitations with allowing people to choose whether or not they get the shot as opposed to some sort of a mandatory vaccination? Yeah, I don't. I, I, I can. I'm sure Dr. Hanley would have some conversations historically about uh, Canada and 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 vaccinations. I, I have not heard in any of the conversations I've had in the last year on on uh, on, on this particular uh, uh, vaccinations or or the disease itself about any mandatory anything. Uh, we really believe as a as uh, as a nation we can get to that herd immunity, um, and you know it would be very unprecedented for any jurisdiction to do something but which is mandatory. Yeah, I, I can um, echo that. I, I, I think there are no there are no plans or efforts anywhere that I'm aware of to make this uh, mandatory. I think we can uh, easily uh, get to um, to a herd immunity, and even though we 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 again we don't know what that number actually is yet, and and it may take us some time. But but if we're you know aiming for that kind of seventy percent mark, seventy five percent. Uh, as a reasonable estimate of herd immunity, I see absolutely no reason why we can't get to that or, or um, higher, uh, potentially even significantly higher, um, with just providing the right information. Um, so uh, we know, I, I know that there are always going to be a few hardliners there out there who um, who will not um, get a vaccine, and making it mandatory actually would significant would not significantly change that that small uh, number. So it, it's really there's a, there's always going to be a few refusers, but most people just want the confidence and the right information, and uh, that's what we're 
we're um, um, hoping and, and helping to provide with our ongoing um, collection of information with these individual conversations that, that we're having. Uh, I know that um, the, the physician community here is passionate about um, helping patients, um, helping their own patients or patients with questions to to also get that get get the right information so so people can make decisions. That's the that's the climate that we work in. It's the most successful model when it's applied uh, properly. Um, so uh, that's the uh, that's the approach that we're taking. Thank you. We'll move now to Nick, Canadian Press. It would appear that Nick is no longer with us. Um, we'll we'll check back at the end. On va maintenant passer à Marine Arabareal. Merci. Euh, avec la campagne de vaccination qui euh, semble avoir un bilan positif, selon le docteur Anley, euh, est-ce que ça va avoir un impact sur euh, les la décision que les étudiants de 10e à 12e année euh, soient à temps partiel euh, à l'école ou est-ce que euh, est, ce sont deux choses qui ne sont pas reliées So with the uh, with the vaccination campaign going on uh, well and going well uh, positively so will that have an impact on the grade 12 students coming back full time into schools euh, 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 juste pour clarifier, vous parlez de, de cette année-là ou, ou pour la prochaine année? Pour cette année. Euh, oui, juste euh, peut-être euh, euh, pour la première chose, c'est une décision de département d'éducation, euh, sûrement avec, euh, bien sûr, avec la, les conseils que je, 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 je donne selon le, le climat de santé. Euh, mais euh, j'ai... Euh, je, je pense que ça ne sera pas réaliste euh, parce qu'on on, on a des projections maintenant jusqu'au fin mars, même le mois d'avril, avant que le cible et euh, euh, qu'on arrive au cible d'avoir la population adulte vaccinée. Donc, euh, à ce moment-là, pour changer, euh, euh, pour, la, pour les derniers deux mois de, de, de l'année la, de scolaire, je pense que ce n'est probablement pas pratique, euh, ni pour les étudiants, ni pour les familles, euh, ni pour les personnels. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est plutôt une question de, de planification pour, pour l'année à, à venir. Et on est déjà en conversation euh, avec le département d'éducation pour, euh, pour ces raisons, ça. Uh, just to uh, translate uh, what I explained, uh, the, the question about whether this will have an impact on, you know, the full-time return to school, I, I think, uh, again, this is a depart Department of Education decision, of course, so I don't want to um, speak uh, for the department. But in the, I, I think in the, uh, the advice that I provide based on the, the situation, the COVID and the, the general health situation, I think that uh, that would not be a really realistic projection to factor in uh, uh, vaccine immunity into that conversation. I think by the time we get to our goal, which is by April to have the uh, to, to have reached our our target, uh, hopefully, um, I think that would be probably quite problematic to then change the rest of the school year. Uh, I know disruption in itself is a um, uh, you know, will interfere with the with the learning experience, whether for the students, whether for the families, or whether for the for the teachers and personnel. So, I think that's probably not realistic. I think more, it's more like how will this influence the planning for uh, for next uh, year? And of course, that's already a, a conversation started with the Department of Education. Merci. Avez-vous une question, Marine? Oui, euh, pour euh, M. Silver, euh, on, il y a des discussions en ce moment sur euh, la potentielle euh, création d'un passeport euh, d'immunité, d'un document qui certifie si les personnes ont eu le, le vaccin ou pas. Est-ce que euh, vous êtes en, 
en discussion à ce sujet-là par rapport à la réouverture des frontières? So the question is for the Premier. There is a lot of discussions right now for a vaccination passport or at least an attestation that vaccination has been done. Uh, do you have discussions on this and how much influence can it have on the opening of the borders? Yeah, it's a very good question, uh, and I think it's a good segue from the f uh, other question uh, from John uh, about mandatory. Uh, you know, what we're hearing from Yukoners uh, as far as vaccinations, most Yukoners see uh, a, uh, a vaccine as an ability to be more mobile. Um, now, as far as any conversations on a national level, I would imagine more of those conversations would be happening on the national conversations that, minister, that uh, Dr. Hanley is having uh, as far as what that would equate. We, we've talked in these updates in the past about previous uh, uh, vaccines that were used like that, uh, polio, for example. Um, we don't talk much in terms of um, what it means to have a passport to travel based upon having a vaccination. What we do talk about is the ability for our health care system to uh, to uh, monitor and to and to uh, um, ID everybody who does have uh, the, the shot, uh, making sure that we have that uh, system in place uh, so that we have the records in place. That's really important to us right now. I think what we're going to see, and you know, Dr. Hanley would be the, the authority on this, is you know, again, whether it's a vaccine or, or wearing your mask or self-isolating, those types of things, these are all variables, these are all tools in our toolkit that we are going to use to plank the curve. We're watching the curve to plank, and we believe with what we're hearing with, uh, and again, I mean, six months ago to think that we're in a situation to have a vaccine rolling out uh, would have been, uh, you know, very optimistic. Um, so I think we'll see a situation in Canada, uh, in other nations as well, where the vaccine strategies will plank the curve, and that alone will help us to get back to a more sense of normalcy. Dr. Hanley? Yeah, it's. Uh, I agree with what the Premier said, and, and, and clearly this is a very important uh, question, and, and it's one that we just don't have enough information to answer yet. It's, it's of urgent, uh, I would say, intense interest internationally, not just uh, not just in, in Yukon, but internationally and nationally. Um, so, so I think uh, more to come. Again, I think our, our approach really is on population immunity. What uh, there are many questions as to how this applies to a particular particular individual. And just keep in mind some of the questions that are still outstanding. If we, for instance, um, find in, in real life, as it were, that this vaccine is 95% is effective as, we, uh, as the clinical trials have shown, that still means that 1 in 20 individuals uh, may not be protected. So if you're talking about a passport that applies to one individual, then what about those 1 in 20 when, in fact, it's like a blank uh, passport in a way? The other thing is we still don't know the effect. We don't have the evidence yet on effect of the vaccine on transmission. Uh, we don't have that uh, um, um, durability information at how long will the vaccine last and if or how often would you need to renew either your vaccine or your passport as it were. So there, there is just many, many questions and right now our goal is to continue to get our population impact, uh, our population um, vaccinated up to that goal of, uh, of herd immunity to get to that big next rung and then with all of our other layers to use that to figure out where we are and where we can go next, whether we're talking talking internationally or, or nationally or as a territory. Thank you. We'll move to Philippe, CBC Yukon. Uh, bien sûr, oui. Uh, C'est uh, uh, ce que j'ai expliqué uh, en suivant des de, 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 de commentaires de la première, de, de première c'était pour juste expliquer ce qu'il y a. C'est une, une question très importante, mais, mais uh, c'est aussi une, une question qui applique aux individuels. Um, pour le moment, notre, uh, um, notre but est de, de concentrer sur les besoins de la population, d'arriver de, de, ou, ou cible d'avoir une population immune. Et, euh, et, et avec une, une population immune, euh, d'examiner de, de, de toutes les implications pour les mouvements des gens avec cette, euh, cette but. Donc, euh, 
Il y a beaucoup de questions pour l'application la, d'un individuel. Est-ce qu'un individuel est vraiment uh, vacciné si un sur 20 n'est pas forcément uh, protégé avec le vaccin? Euh, L'effet sur le vaccin, sur la transmission de COVID, le, um, le, le longueur de, 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 um, de protection et uh, donc est-ce qu'il faut renouveler le vaccin après quelques mois, quelques années? Donc, et, et le passeport aussi. Donc, il y a beaucoup de questions, mais juste pour affirmer que c'est une question examinée au niveau international et, et aussi national et, et à ce moment. Et avec les mois à venir, on va arriver à une position plus claire sur cela. Merci. Uh, we'll move now to Philippe at CBC Yukon. Philippe? Oh, I apologize. Uh, is there any news about Atlin, BC? They're only accessible, of course, from Yukon, but uh, they're not included in uh, the Yukon schedule. I've been unable to get news from Northern Health in BC. I, I thought I would ask if we know when people there can expect the vaccine. Uh, yeah, I talked with uh, John Horgan uh, yesterday. Uh, we had a great meeting about a whole bunch of things, but uh, we definitely talked about our continuing commitment uh, to places like Lower Post uh, and also Atland. Uh, so that is being worked out as we as we speak, and uh, we we made good on that commitment. Uh, we have, n unless you have anything else to, to share, Dr. Hanley, uh, we don't uh, have uh, uh, information on when right now for Atland, but uh, that commitment is still solid. Thank you. Follow up, Philippe. I just wonder if it would be possible for residents of Atlin to ever come in uh, to the uh, Whitehorse Clinic. Can people from communities come into Whitehorse once that is open? Well, yeah. Again, we will have the uh, the clinic open in a couple of weeks in Whitehorse for general population, and we, we are seeing, for example, people in uh, in communities uh, that were like Watson Lake, for example. If you missed your turn there for whatever reason, that you would still be able to come in uh, to that general clinic um, as well. So that would uh, be the same for people in Atland or for Lower Post, uh, Fort Liard, those, uh, or sorry, uh, Lower Post in those areas. Yeah, I, I, Philip. Just I, I think there are still just some details, at least some some of those operational details still being worked out. But but as the premier said, we we are committed to um, to covering the um, Atlin. We've been working hard uh, with with Northern Health um, uh, region in, in BC, um, and and so some of those details are are still being worked out. But when, once we have all of that confirmed, we will make sure that, of course, that the Atlin residents as well as Yukon residents are informed of the uh, of the process um, for Atlan. Thank you. We'll move to Chris, CBC. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, Premier Silver mentioned that 91% um, of long-term care residents have now been vaccinated. I'm just wondering if, if either the Premier or Dr. Hanley could explain what accounts for the 9% who haven't been vaccinated yet and, and I guess, when do you foresee them getting vaccinated? Yeah, I can uh, I, I can um, uh, comment on that. Um, if, if when you know, again, I, I think it goes back to that more general conversation. Um, some people need um, um, may not have been ready. They may not have felt ready. Uh, we're of course not mandating the vaccine. We're we're encouraging those conversations. Um, so I, I can't really speak in, sort of individually for those nine percent. I think we the, the ninety one percent is a very encouraging. Uh, number um, it, it really gives that assurance of you know having that level of protection um, amongst the residents um, it puts us in a really good position to prevent uh, circulation of COVID-19 in in the facility and then it comes back to you know having those individual conversations with the residents and, and if they are ready uh, then making sure that uh, we give them the opportunity for for the vaccine and and perhaps um, perhaps 
perhaps that's you know going to be uh, when I, I I would anticipate that when they go back, which is not that long from now, when they go back for the follow up, the second dose, there may well be individuals who have decided that they're ready for the first dose, and then we would take care of them uh, in another round for the for the second dose. Next question, Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, just from just to follow up on one of Haley's questions, and and just sort of reading in between the line of uh, the response there. For example, the the line as long as our vaccine supplies continue to roll in, um, it, it does not sound to me like you're sure that the next shipments of the Moderna vaccine are are going to actually arrive. So. How concerned are you that we're actually going to get the shots that we've been led to believe we're getting? Uh, and if I can just tack on to that, uh, what in your mind is the risk that the, the Pfizer shortage is going to create a situation where perhaps other provinces decide to uh, dip into the supply of Moderna vaccine that was supposed to go to the Yukon? Yeah, I would say I'm not concerned at all. Uh, again, as we uh, follow the National Advisory uh, Committee's uh, uh, recommendations, uh, northern rural and indigenous communities being prioritized, um, not concerned, uh, but really wanting to, for, uh, to expedite, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the the three-month uh, window uh, as quickly as possible. And the reason why we can say that is because of the amazing work that the teams have done uh, to be ready to vaccinate. And so it's more of a call of, you know, when Moderna says, internationally we want to make sure that we're going to give doses out where we can get them expedited as quickly as possible Yukon is saying look no further and I think a lot of Canadian provinces are saying that and I'd say as far as Pfizer you know all along the way whether it be uh, approval through Health Canada um, shipments everything has been uh, you know from the original um, uh, plans that we saw we've seen everything shorten up and be expedited the only time we've ever heard uh, a delay was the announcement this week with Pfizer that was the one time that I've really seen a delay in any of these supplies. So uh, not concerned at all uh, that uh, Ottawa won't be able to make good on our commitment. Uh, but again, our conversations with Ottawa have been, we would really appreciate as soon as you know uh, the exact dates of delivery. And, and the other comment, uh, as aggressive, is we're ready for those doses as soon as you get them. Dr. Hanley? Yeah, I, I'll just add, uh, I, 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 again, um, I, I I also have complete confidence. Uh, it's it's just you know the the Pfizer disruption um, was not anticipated. So it's just to recognize that sometimes something happens that you know there is a disruption. We've seen this with other vaccine campaigns. So it's really just always to have that kind of though the what if in, in and then contingency planning in the in the back of our minds. But um, no, though there there is no. And I've been again involved in national conversations. Conversations on this uh, do not anticipate any disruption of the Moderna supply based on what's happening with Pfizer or any of that dipping in. No, not, not at all. There's no intention to do that. Um, and uh, uh, I have had no information to indicate any um, any implication about um, supplies of Moderna. As the Premier says, so far they have been, um, if anything, um, ahead of schedule. Um, and um, and there's no indication that this, up to now that we'll be seeing any um, any delay in, in delivery. It's just, yeah, we always like to see those delivery dates, you know, even into March, nailed down. And that's what, uh, that's what we want to see. Thank you. We'll move to Tim Whitehorse Star. Yes, hello. Uh, my first question is about uh, the subject of vaccine hesitancy that you, know, you were referring to earlier in the briefing. One, uh, one or two of the common things that I've heard uh, from people who are reluctant to get the vaccine is one, they don't like the fact that they have to continue with the safety precautions like wearing a mask. And two, those safety precautions exist because there's no evidence one way or another as yet that these vaccines will prevent transmission. They might give you immunity, but it doesn't mean that you can't pass it on. So someone with concerns like that, what would you say to them? Yeah, they're, they're uh, really good questions. And... Um 
you know, there, I, I, there's a, I, I hope a few useful things that, that we can say. One is, this is not uncommon with a, with a new vaccine, is that, uh, you know, in, obviously information about how long it's going to last and some of the nuances of um, the actual biological action uh, need to be worked out with further study of the phase three trials and with also the real kind of aftermarket experience of the real life experience um, and, and uh, ongoing effectiveness. So that is information that we will get as we go, but it's only information we'll have as we get our populations vaccinated and then see the, the actual real life, real life effect. I would also say that, um, you know, it, it's more likely that it will have an effect of, uh, on transmission than not. We just have not been able to, the, the studies have not yet been able to, to document that. But also, if you have an 80% um, a vaccinated population, uh, then automatically by having that many people protected, you will disrupt transmission um, because there will be less susceptible hosts um, to, um, to, uh, to get sick with the, with the vaccine. So in effect, you're, uh, you're hugely dampening down the effect or the burden that, that COVID will, will present just because the impact will be that much less. Um, and uh, the I can't actually remember what the first question, uh, the first part of that was. Um, maybe, uh, Tim, you can reiterate. All right. Um, yeah, the first part was uh, they're asking what the point of having the vaccine is if they have to continue with safety precautions like wearing masks and the safe sex. Yeah, I, I, well, clearly... Uh, clearly, this is because we need to get to that level first, and then we also n need to fully answer all of those other questions. So I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, we, we can't really have one without the other. What we, we all want uh, the vaccine. We know that the vaccine is key to our way out of this uh, pandemic. And we also know that I, I feel that there's some urgency to reach um, uh, herd, herd immunity or population immunity as soon as we can, whether we're, in, whether we're talking about Yukon or, or Canada or even uh, globally, because then, then we have the best chance of limiting the effects of, of new variants, uh, vaccine escape variants, um, other complications with, with uh, mutations in this, in this vaccine. So, uh, we, we are looking to a future when we will be able to unravel many of these public health measures, and, and that's something that we're already trying to, to work on and anticipate. But clearly we need not only the population immunity in order to do that, but, but we need that, that kind of accumulating evidence to then figure out the, the order and the way of, of unraveling those public health measures. So, so really that it, it goes together. We, it's, uh, the vaccine is clearly going to get us to a much more comfortable level in terms of protection from COVID. And then we will be in a position to analyze the, uh, the way that we can gradually lift, um, lift measures. It's just that we need to get there first. And while we're getting there, we need all of these measures to be in place to protect us from circulation of COVID in the community. Premier Silver? Yeah, I think the simple uh, analogy for me is, um, you know, Watson Lake might be one of the first communities in Canada that have a general population uh, being vaccinated. And uh, so I'm going to go up to Dawson uh, next week and I'll be part of a general population vaccination there as well. Can't wait to get my shot, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop washing my hands, right? Um, you know, or, or socially distancing because every one of these things that we do, as we say every week that we're here, you're, you're doing these precautions to make others be protected. And whether that is as a jurisdiction of Yukon or just as a neighborly community, I still have the ability to pass a virus on through hand-to-hand -hand contact, uh, even though I have received my vaccination. So you know, again, we, we do these measures for our community, not as much for ourselves. Once we as our own individuals getting vaccinated ahead of the curve, uh, we still have to maintain uh, our diligence until the curve gets planked in general. Thank you. Tim, do you have a second question? 
Yes, I do. Um, I'd just like to refer back to the information coming out uh, from the government in regards to policies like, in particular, self-isolation. I was watching some, a conversation on social media earlier this week that kind of fascinated me because there was all kinds of confusion over what the proper uh, techniques were for self-isolating. And a lot of the people were saying that they were quoting stuff from the government or government officials, and at least half of them were not agreeing with each other. So has there been an adequate uh, job done informing the public on what some of these measures are? Uh, I, I absolutely, be- absolutely believe so. Um, information has changed as we've gone through phases of, of our plan forward, but the most accurate information is always available on UConn.ca. Also, the phone number that we mentioned over and over again as well. Uh, those individuals, uh, I've used those phone numbers quite a bit myself, uh, you know, asking and answering questions, and they have the most up-to-date information. Now, information does change over time, uh, and we saw in the summer as well, uh, you know, because of the diligence of Dr. Hanley and the guidelines and working with community services to get alternative self-isolation plans. Lots of questions about what one plan means for one group compared to another, those types of things. But uh, the anecdotally, the information I have received uh, and also in our weekly updates with all of the providers of, of uh, emergency measures or health measures, uh, what we see is a coordinated team that has a really good ability to uh, communicate uh, and, uh, and our website is always up to date. Dr. Henley? I'll just add a couple of things. One is um, when I'm... Um Thinking through something, I, I always go back to check uh, what, what does the actual written guideline uh, say um, as the, the kind of the gold standard. Uh, the second thing is, um, if I notice something that's not clear, I, I will certainly point it out and we'll fix it. So I think if there are specifics about something that is not clear, we will we will and have a history. I think of always trying to trying to clarify um, to uh, to make sure that people have uh, clear information about what to do. So. Uh, I, I, I do think, um, you know, some of this is pretty complex information and, and we're really trying to achieve uh, clarity uh, within that complex information. Um, but uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, working on the messages around self-isolation and what the obligations are and what the orders are. I think it's all there, but if you see something specific that's not clear, I think we're happy to take another look and see if we can um, adjust the wording. Thank you. I will just circle back to see if Nick from Canadian Press is with us. And hearing nothing, I would like to uh, thank everyone for their time today. The next COVID-19 update will take place on Wednesday, January 27th at 1.30 p.m.